us tonight. And again, it's good to see all of you here this evening. As you know, we're in our series through the Sermon on the Mount called um, Salt and Light. And tonight's message is back in that series, it's called Keeping Your Word. And so Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. You can go to the blog, you can follow along, or you can just look at the screen, starting in verse 33. Let's all stand together. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray this evening that you would teach us and help us to keep our word to our spouses, to our children, to our church family, to our neighbors around us, but more than anyone, to you, God. Help us to keep our word to you. Keep our eyes upon Jesus Christ, who was faithful all the way to the end. It's in his name we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. You may be seated. So in the passage we just read, Jesus is raising the bar on how to make and keep promises. Just like today, people back then made a lot of promises which they never intended to keep. And even if they intended to keep, they were not so resolute about them, so when things changed, they broke their promises. In fact, they had become experts on breaking promises. The rabbis created a whole system of rules and regulations that allowed people to get out of their vows and their oaths. Jesus told them, point blank, stop all this nonsense, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. You know, people haven't changed a whole lot in the past 2,000 years. They still make excuses. They still look for loopholes. They're always looking for the escape hatch. They're trying to get out of keeping their word. Would you agree that gone are the days when a man's word and a handshake was all that you needed? I don't even know that world, okay? But some of you may remember that world where all you needed was a word and a handshake, and that's all there was to it. Unfortunately, that world doesn't exist. And if I may add something to that, we're living in a world where even Christians, sadly, are no better. We're not keeping our word either. In fact, we usually have a verse to go with it, right? Let me tell you why I don't do that. Because the Bible says in such and such a book, and we'll find some obscure reference and, and just twist it all around to say, this is why I did not keep my word. Let me ask you some questions before we dive into this passage. What kind of a person are you? Are you a person who keeps his word? Are you a person who keeps her promises? Are you known as a promise breaker? Or are you known as a promise keeper? Here's a deeper question. Do you keep your word towards God? You know, sadly, what I found is more promises are broken to God than to anybody else. We will keep our promises to family members. We may keep our promises to people around us, church, family, who cares? But God, more promises are broken to Him than to anybody else. So the question tonight is, are you a promise keeper or are you
are you a promise breaker? Here's a deeper question. Are you saved? See, unless you have the Holy Spirit in your life, I know you hear that from me every week, no promise will be sacred. It's the Holy Spirit in your heart that says, no matter what, you keep your word. Tonight, we're going to try to understand the importance of keeping our word not just to family, friends, neighbors, church people, but especially to God. How important that is. So, three things, oh, actually four things we're going to try to understand. Number one is that human tendency is to break our word. I'm not saying every time humans break their promises, but we, are, we have that nature in us to break our promises. Listen to what Jesus said to these people. He said, I say to you, do not swear at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor by your head, because you cannot change the color of your hair. Some people have taken that passage to say, well, look, there it is. We're not supposed to take any oath. We're not supposed to make a vow. That's it. So then you have people like Anabaptists and Quakers who say, we don't take an oath. We don't pledge allegiance to the flag. We don't do any of those things. Is that what Jesus had in mind? No. To understand what's happening here, you have to go back to the Mishnah. Mishnah is the Jewish oral tradition. The Jewish people, along with the Old Testament, the Torah, they had all these other writings that interpreted the Old Testament. So in the Mishnah, they have this, this section called the Shavuot, the section on the oaths. And according to this section, God's name was very sacred. You're not supposed to take God's name. The only time you can use God's name is if you were the high priest, and that too, once a year, on the Day of Atonement. So, if you made any vows and promises saying Yahweh, guess what? You can break them because they don't count. Can you imagine what people say? Ooh, yeah, come to think of it, I made a promise by Adonai. Uh, I don't have to keep it, do I? No, you don't have to keep it because that promise doesn't count. You are not supposed to take God's name. These rabbis also came up with a system called Kinuim where you could substitute God's name with some alphabets. For example, Adonai is Aleph and Dalit, A and D. So you can say, by A and D, I will keep my word. You're writing your little promise and the scribe is watching you. By mistake, you extend the D a little bit, and it looks like a G. Well, a year later, you didn't keep your word, so you have to go to the court of law, and, and, the, and the rabbi over there says, let me see, what you write? A and what is this? Looks like a G to me. Well, if it's a D, then you got to keep your word. You got to pay back that lamb, or you got to keep your wife, uh, but if it's a G, well, I mean, you don't have to, because God's name, Adonai, is not A and G, it's A and D. Are you understanding what these people did with the law of God? But they didn't stop there. They came up with a lot of innocuous substitutes for the name of God. So, you know, uh, if you swear by heaven and earth or Jerusalem or your hair or your head, guess what? It doesn't count because, because all that is wrong. So, so if you, by mistake or intentionally, made a promise and said, hey, I'll tell you what, by heaven, I will make sure I'll cut all your grass for you. Or by heaven, I'll make sure that I will, um, I will handle this situation for you. And, and you go to the court of law, and they look at it and say, did you say by heaven? Uh-huh. Well, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not legally binding anymore. <laughs> the point is, 
they had created so many loopholes and technicalities that pretty much you could get away by breaking any promise you ever made. So Jesus comes on the scene and he says, this is wickedness. What in the world are you guys doing? Do you know that heaven is God's throne? The earth is his footstool. Jerusalem is his city. And your head, you're talking about his head or is it my head or whose hair? Do you know that God made you so it doesn't really matter what you said in that document or you failed to write or you extended the D and made it a G? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You're trying to manipulate the system. Isn't it interesting that human beings haven't changed one bit? (laughs) We know how to twist and work the system. We make promises because we like the immediate benefit But when it's time for us to ante up or do our part, we're like, um, I don't know if I promised you that. Let me give you some illustration. A father promises his son, hey, look, let me watch this game. Or let me finish this, this little project. Once I do this, son, I promise you I'll come out there and play ball with you. He has no intentions of playing ball. He is tired. He is worn out. It's been a long week. And he's waiting for the sun to go down. And right about 6 o'clock, dad says, hey, man, how are you doing? Dad, are you ready to play ball? Well, I tell you what, look out. Man, I tell you, it's dark outside. You know what? I promise you, son, tomorrow, tomorrow, we'll do this. You see, in his heart, he was hoping. (laughs) Are you catching this? I'm not talking about the good dads in this place. He was hoping the sun will go down. So his son will just say, okay, dad, fine, tomorrow we'll do it. Tomorrow, son, I'm going to be out of town. But I tell you what, this weekend, this weekend, I promise you, we'll do this. Folks, this was a very tough message to prepare. Because all over this message, the Holy Spirit was saying, you know, you are the man. You're the one who breaks his promises. Or a husband and a wife, I promise you, honey, if you just do this for me today, I promise you I'll take care of that. Or I promise you I'll take you out. Once that immediate benefit is realized, what does a spouse say? I hope she forgets it. I hope she forgets it because it's been a long week. The last thing I want to do is go out to the mall and walk up and down those escalators and go look for something that doesn't exist. We are masters of breaking our promises. Let me go a little step further. A, a man, young man tells this, this beautiful young girl, hey, look, look, just, just come a little closer to me. You know, look, if you do that, it'll tell me that you really love me. Guess what she does? She thinks, okay, if this may prove to him that, he, that I really love him, then he can give me his promise. What happens when he gets what he wants? I'll see you later. This is human nature. This is how we are. We're prone to break our promises. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, listen to what it says. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Let me ask you tonight. Are you an honest and forthright person, or are you a deceitful, manipulative, selfish, self-centered person? Do people trust you? Are you a person who is known for keeping a promise? If I said, I will do it, I will do it. doesn't matter. I will stop whatever else, and I will keep my word. Are you always looking for some technicality to get out from obeying God? I mean, the Jewish people built this whole system. But trust me, we do the same thing, don't we? We have our technicalities too. Human tendency is to break our word. But let me go to number two. 
divine tendencies to keep his word. The reason Jesus even brought up this matter is because being God himself, breaking promises goes against everything in his nature. God is a God who keeps his word. Human beings, we don't, but he always does. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. What does it say about him? What does it say? The faithful God. Can you all see it too? I mean, I can see it. Can you all see it? What does it say? Faithful. It means he keeps his word. How long does he keep his word? His covenant and his mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. It means it doesn't matter if you die off. God says, I'm going to keep my word to your children and your grandchildren. You know, repeatedly in the Old Testament, God made vows and oaths to his people. For example, in Genesis 9, 11, God made a vow to Noah and his son. And he said, I will establish this covenant with you. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Two weeks ago, I was wondering. I was like, man, this, this rain is not stopping. But guess what? God made a promise. Never again by flood. Now, he didn't say never again by fire, did he? That's still coming. In Genesis 22, God made a vow to Abraham. He said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have not withheld your son, your only son. Remember when God said, Isaac, uh, told Abraham, take your son Isaac, your only son, go up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Abraham obeyed God. God said, by myself. You know, isn't that amazing? God says, <laughs> I put my hand on my own head because he is the greatest. And what is his promise? The promise is this, the blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. The book of Hebrews picks up on it in Hebrews 6.13. It says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Again, God kept his word. I don't have time enough in this 20 minutes to go through every passage in the Old Testament that tells you that God kept his word, God kept his word, God kept his word. In Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11, God made a vow saying, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. God says, all I want is for lost people to get saved. He said, that is my promise. And that's what God has been doing for the past, what? Ever since creation began. In Judges chapter 2 verse 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Human beings break promises. God does not. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5, Daniel prayed and he prayed to the Lord. He said, he said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. I guess what I'm saying you, to you tonight is sometimes we, we tend to project how we looked at our father or a grandfather or somebody precious to us and we think this is how God is. My dad was a wonderful man, still is, but let me tell you this. There are some promises he couldn't keep. But God never failed, even once. He is always faithful. God is a promise-keeping God. Here comes number three. Human tendencies to break our word. Divine tendencies to keep His word. God expects us to keep our word. Listen to what Jesus said in 37. He said, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. God said, I know what you're prone to do. I see your wicked system, but my standard is for you to keep your word like I keep my word. Now, here's some, uh, some examples where we need to keep our word. Number one, we need to keep our word to our spouses. Right? 
I mean, that to me is my primary responsibility. If I don't keep my promise to Nicole, it doesn't really matter what I promise you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I promise all the lost people in the world. It doesn't matter what I promise to even God. I need to make my promise and keep my promise to Nicole first. You know why? Because about 20 years ago, I stood at the altar. And I heard this pastor say, Dearly beloved, we are gathered together before the presence of God and these witnesses. I took an oath. You see, in every wedding, for the past 17 years, I've done many, many weddings. And and sometimes I want to take that out, you know, before the presence of God. I mean, why make them lie on their wedding day? (laughs) You know, let's take that whole section out. Because, you know, you go out there and you fool around and you mess out. We're taking an oath before God. And then we have have these vows that we take. What are those vows? I promise to take you so and so to be my husband or my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward. What else? For better or worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I promise to love and cherish you. You made a vow. Now, folks, tonight is not a night to beat up on you if you, if you uh, have gone through a divorce or, or you have gone through some a tough time in your marriage. This is not the purpose of that. I'm challenging all of us to reexamine the vows we take before God. In our own country, 40 to 50 percent is a divorce rate. And when the wedding is done, what do we say? This is what I say. By the authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel in the presence of God and these assembled witnesses, it is my privilege to announce you husband and wife. And then I always add this little statement, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Do you know how many people lie (laughs) based on that ceremony? Do you know how many thousands of people keep lying? And breaking their promises. We break our promises to our children. You see, uh, not just playing ball or I'll play catch with you. Uh, When you bring a child into this world, you are making a covenant with God that you will lead that child in His way. That is a promise you've made. Here's a question tonight. Are you keeping your promise? How do you keep that promise? Number one, I have to walk in God's way. First and foremost is for me to make sure that my relationship with God is right. Number two, now I have to make sure that I live a life that when I tell them, hey, listen, you need to be in church, I need to be in church. It's a commitment. If I tell them, you need to have a good devotional life, guess what? Since I made a covenant with God to raise them in God's way, I have to have a good devotional life. You see, we are making promises all the time, and yet our yes is not yes, our no is not no. We find technicalities. You don't know what I've been through in my life. Well, what kind of an example have you set for your children? Well, you don't know what I've been through in my life. Okay, no different than those Jewish rabbis who said, oh, was it Aleph and Dalit or was it Aleph and Gimel? What was it? Oh, yeah, you don't have to keep that one because this is what happened to you. God expects us to keep our word to our spouses, to our children. What else? To our church family. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. If you say, I'll be there, Be there. If you say, I will serve, then serve. You know how many times people treat the church as if it doesn't really matter. I mean, now, my job, I will keep my word. But church, 
They'll find somebody. You know, when you chose to join with this body, you have obligated yourself to serve with this body. If my finger tomorrow came up to me and said, I don't want to be part of this body. You know what? I, I, I'm just tired. I'm just going to leave. Just, just rest for a while. I'll be in trouble, won't I? <laughs> you can't do that. I need you. I need you to type. I need you to drive. I need you to eat. Guess what people do then? I love this one. They say, I'll preach. I ain't going to promise anything. I tell you what, I ain't gonna prom- I tell, you know what the Bible says? Yes, be yes, no, be no. I don't want to say anything. And then, I, then you, know, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. You're a weasel. You have found a technicality. Your technicality is this. If I don't promise, then I don't have to keep anything. And so I'm good. No, it is worse because now you are a hypocrite. Let me tell you something here tonight. I am more impressed with the man or the woman who serves faithfully than the one who claims to know all the Bible. I love seeing somebody who says, man, I'll get down there, I'll take care of that, or I'll play this, or I'll handle this. That, to me, is praiseworthy than the one who says, I know so much about the Bible, I'll tell you what, I'm not interested. Do you keep your word? To our neighbors, as a Christian, I'm obligated to keep my promises to my neighbors, which includes people next door, people at work, people in the community. I'm obligated as a Christian for me to break my promise. What a shame. And I know it's tough sometimes when you're financially bound and you have bills and you get late on a bill or a check bounces. It is tough. But as a Christian, we are obligated to rectify it. You don't dodge them. You call them up and say, listen, I messed up over there. We had a rough time. But please let me make it right. It is our obligation that when we have made a promise that if you give me that goods, I will pay you for this, I'm obligated to meet my obligations. And somebody finds out that you are a Christian. They should do everything they can to hire you. But I tell you what, if you get them, they keep their word. They don't make excuses. They don't dodge work, man. They keep their word. They will work their tail off for you. Isn't that sad that in today's society, it doesn't mean anything? God expects us to keep our word to our spouses, our children, our church family, our neighbors. But do you know God expects us to keep our word to Him? We are to keep our promises to God. Do you know how many promises are made on sick beds and death beds? And during financial struggles and relational problems that people never fulfill? God, if you just get me out of this situation, I promise you, I will do this for you. Once you get out of the situation, oh well, see you, God. You're in the hospital. God, would you you help me? And then he sent out emails and texts to everybody. Would you please keep me in prayer? You get healed. You get out. I tell you what, that's the finest hospital anywhere in the world. You didn't keep your word. Isn't that amazing? Human tendency is to break promises. Divine tendency to, is to keep His word. Jesus did not say, oh, I understand. It gets hard. Some, you know, He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Keep your word, especially to God. Listen to what it says in Psalm 16, 66, verse 13. It says, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. 
How many of y'all have failed to keep your promise or your promises to God? Here comes the last point. The Holy Spirit enables us to keep our word. The human heart is wicked. It is prone to look for excuses to get out of keeping our word. The divine standard is high. Every time God says, I will do it, He does it. He expects me to be like Him, but He understands that I can't. What is the solution? The Holy Spirit. Listen to the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. What is faithfulness? When you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, He is the one who enables you to be faithful. Folks, some days I don't want to keep my promise to Nicole. But he is the one who enables me to keep my word. Many days I'm busy. I got a lot on me. I'm tired. I don't want to keep my promises to my children. The Holy Spirit enables me to be faithful. It's a fruit to my church family. Temptations come all the time. It is so easy to take the bite. It is so easy to take the lure of the enemy. The Holy Spirit helps me to stay faithful. God has said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. When I look at this congregation, I know that God has called me to be a godly shepherd. That is my responsibility. My yes is yes. How can I do that? It's the Holy Spirit. How about when it comes to God? Isn't that amazing that God has to help us be faithful to Him? We can't even do that. He has to enable us to be faithful to Him. Let me ask you some questions tonight. What kind of a person are you? Are you a person who can be trusted? Are you a person who keeps his word or her word? Are you a person who is a promise keeper? Or are you a promise breaker? As I mentioned to you, this was a tough message because every single step of the message the Holy Spirit was telling me how about you. And I'm like, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I'm here to preach to them. He's like, how about you? Are you keeping your word to me? Do you know at the end of that discussion, I was so tired. And that's when the Holy Spirit said, you know, it's not up to you to help to do it anyways. If you let me, I'll be faithful through you. If you let me, trust me. Two questions tonight. Number one, are you saved? If you do not know Jesus Christ, well, you cannot have the Holy Spirit. You have to begin there. Question number two. Are you trusting in the Holy Spirit to help you live the Christian life? Are you trusting Him to help you keep your promises, to keep your vows, to keep your oaths to each other, to loved ones, but also towards God? As we go in this invitation, two things, simple. Number one, if you've never been saved, today's the day of salvation. Number two, if you are saved, but you're not trusting in the Holy Spirit, tonight you need to submit to Him. Say, I can't do this. Would you help me? He is waiting to help us. What does the Bible call Him? The encourager. He encourages us. When we don't feel like going the extra mile, He comes alongside and says, no, I can help you. Let's all stand together. And Holy Spirit, tonight, our heart's desire is to be promise keepers. Men and women whose yes will be yes and no will be no. 
not people who will dodge responsibilities or make excuses, but men and women who will stand up and say, if this is what I promised, I will fulfill by the grace of God. Our culture, our society desperately needs to see men and women who keep their word and even young people who stand by their promises. Help us tonight.